Hello. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for coming on this Friday afternoon. Holidays in two countries, two cantons, a sunny day, for this very exciting lecture by Professor Angelos Hanyotis, who is a Princeton scholar and specializes in antique studies, uh, Hellenistic and Ro in Roman studies. Uh, the projects that are his current interest start from uh, emotions in antiquity up to uh, identity studies, and you have this humbling long list of assignments and projects in, uh, in, on the web linked from our Indico agenda. So I would like to leave ASAP the floor to Professor Hanyotis for this talk. And because we are recording, please uh, first uh, silence your mobiles, please. And also, if you have questions at the end, don't forget to press the button because we want to put the material in CDS and sort it out afterwards. You can ask all kinds of questions. If you don't want them, we will not put them in CDS. So, Professor Hanyotis, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Can you all hear me? Yes. Thank you, Maria, first of all, for the invitation. Thank you for coming. Actually, I should be surprised at your interest on the subject of my talk, the night. But uh, on the other hand, the subject of my talk is at least indirectly connected to what you do here at CERN. Uh, you try to discover the origins of universe and the origins of matter. And the night is, according at least to some Greeks, precisely the answer to your questions. At the beginning is the night. The night is the mother of everything that matters, love and hatred and sleep and death, and so on and so forth. So the first children in Greek creation are the children of the night, and the night stands at the beginning uh, of uh, the world. Uh, but I'm not talk going to talk about Greek myths. I'm going to talk about Greek realities and the way the reality of the night changes throughout the centuries. Let me begin with the good news. And the good news is that unlike many other subjects that ancient historians and historians generally study, the definition of my subject is easy. Believe me, there are subjects in ancient history where I would require a lecture to explain what we are doing and what the word epidosis or aversatism and so on mean. But in the case of the night, the definition is very simple, and it is the same all over the world in every historical period. The night is always the period between sunset and sunrise, between dusk and dawn. And this definition holds true whether you are in Helsinki in the 21st century or in Pharaonic Egypt. What may be different is the duration of the night, but the definition is the same. And now the bad news, and I have plenty of them. The bad news is that um, apart from this simple definition, everything is different depending on gender, depending on age, depending on social position, depending on historical period, uh, and so on and so forth. And with everything, I mean everything from uh, the way we experience uh, the night, from nighttime activities in cities or in the countryside, from the differences in the behavior of animals and the behavior of human animals, everything that stimulates the senses from shadows or street illumination uh, or the snoring of an old man or the alarm uh, of a car in the street, everything that is uh, connected uh, with um, uh, experiences, labor, economic activities, religious activities and so on, everything depends on changing, continually changing historical factors. And these historical factors may be different as I will try to explain. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples, a nocturnal banquet, a drinking party, is experienced differently by the host and the guests or the slave who serves and the flute girl that entertains. 
Waking up late in the morning is sometimes considered as the privilege of the higher social classes, and uh, also sometimes mannerisms may influence the way we behave or perceive the night. For instance, it is somehow believed that insomnia produces good PhD dissertations or good poetry. Uh, I don't know whether this is true or not. The activities that unfold and the experiences that are made during the night depend, as I said, and as I will be continually explain, on constantly changing factors that may range from the organization of labor to religion. Uh, for instance, the obligatory prayers in Christianity and Islam has changed the reality of the night in many cultures. Uh, also, the impact of technology is not uh, negligible. For instance, the invention of electricity, revolutionized nightlife, 24-hour TV and radio have had a tremendous impact on our lives, uh, and also the development of aviation, radars, and infrared has changed, for the worse, the reality of warfare. Uh, some societies know an uninterrupted uh, night sleep, which is an invention of the 19th century. Because of the Industrial Revolution, it is more efficient to divide the day into segments of eight hours, eight hours of work, eight hours of rest, eight hours of work, eight hours of rest, and so on and so forth. Whereas in most of humanity, uh, cultures know the segmented sleep sleeping, waking up because you have seen a dream, giving an order to a slave, going out uh, to buy something, and so on. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. All these continually changing factors that are connected with religion, with society, with culture, with uh, political uh, developments, and so on, explain why some societies have nightclubs and others do not. The nightclub is an invention, again, of the 19th century why some societies have no the evening dress and others do not, why in certain cultures we have specific genres of art that are directly connected with the night, such as, as the nocturne or the Nachtmusik or the Gothic novel or horror movies. All these are things that directly connected with the night and change depending on cultural factors. That nightlife differs depending on the historical context should not be surprising because everything changes depending on historical context, so why not the night as well? All human experiences and actions are subject to change uh, regardless of whether they take place at daytime or during the night. So should a historian bother about the history of the night? Should a historian try to write a history of the night separate, for instance, from a history of the day? Historical research has already answered this question affirmatively, and there are, uh, there's quite a number of books that are dedicated to the night, but they all concern themselves with the night in early modern Europe or in contemporary, in the contemporary world, and what they try to explain is the influence, especially, of technology on, and its impact on the night. Such studies have um, increased our awareness of many phenomena of um, uh, social life, such as, for instance, crime during the night, wives, for instance, murdering their husbands. This is what uh, something that is more likely to happen during the night than during the day, exclusively for practical reasons. Uh, also, policing, witchcraft, uh, piety, fisting, entertaining the court, or entirely new forms of entertainment, such as fireworks, for instance, which could not exist in ancient Greece. Uh, all these are phenomena that have been studied by modern historians in connection with nightlife in primarily in cities. And this is, again, something that I will return later. There is a huge difference between the experience and the reality of the uh, night in urban centers and in the countryside. And, of course, such studies have highlighted the impact of technology on our uh, nightlife. In our self-confident, globalized, and technically advanced world, we can claim, thanks to technology, that the night has been tamed. 
with telephone and Skype, we have made the time zones insignificant and irrelevant, and we have given an entirely new definition to the phrase night on earth. Indeed, one may be tempted to ask whether the impact of technology on the night in the modern period is really uh, so important. Because if you study similar phenomena in the ancient world, and this is what I will try to explain in this talk, we observe that what changes the night is not technology. What changes the night, not as a perception, but what changes the night as a reality, as an experience, as a set of activities, is society, politics, culture, and religion, not technology. Technology is created in order to facilitate nightlife. Nightlife is not created because of the existence of technology. So I will, uh, of course here I am in the temple of technology, so I should be careful about what I say, but I would uh, be tempted to ask the question whether we have technology in order to have a night life or vice versa. And of course I have to admit that such question which was first the chicken or the egg are always wrong. So it is not the one or the other, but it is the dynamic interplay uh, between the two factors, that is society, technology, uh, and so on. Why are the Greeks and their history and their sources, the Greek world, why is the Greek world interested, interesting in connection with this subject? Why should we study uh, the nights in the ancient Greek world? Uh, I can find many reasons, some of them just um, uh, propaganda for my uh, own discipline, prodomo, so to say, because uh, Greek history is so important. If it weren't, I would be studying it. But there are other, far more important reasons. First of all, the Greeks were the first, as far as we know, who systematically reflected on the night and continually and consciously attempted to colonize the night with activities of the day. This is something that distinguishes the Greek world from other ancient cultures where the night was also important, where the night played a part in religion or mythology, but there is no systematic discourse, no systematic reflection, and what is more important, no systematic effort to change the nature of the night, to turn the night into day. Uh, the effort to make the night less dangerous, to make it more efficient, to make it brighter. Um, and all these reflections already started with uh, Greek mythology, for instance, when the night is not only personified, this is a representation of the personification of the night, the night is not only personified but is also worshipped as a goddess. This is something, again, you don't find in other cultures. The second important reason is that, not unlike us, but unlike many other cultures, the Greeks primarily lived in urban centers. This makes the Greek experience uh, very similar to our experiences in urban centers, and what I will be basically talking about will be nightlife in um, uh, urban centers in big cities. Um, and these uh, big cities existed uh, in a globalized world, globalized because of the colonization of the Mediterranean Sea in the 8th and 7th century BC, and later because of the conquest of Alexander the Great that created not a political unity, but a more or less uh, homogeneous, uh, cultural, uh, culturally homogeneous world from Greece uh, to Afghanistan and from the Black Sea to Ethiopia. Uh, so these are basically the two historical periods that I will be discussing. The Hellenistic period, that is from Alexander the Great, 323 to 30 BC, and the Imperial period from 30 BC to um, the establishment of Christianity. And I will talk a little bit also about late antiquity, that is the 4th to the 6th century. What, and this is the third reason why uh, the history of the night in this period is interesting, is that we observe, uh, uh, and we observe this because of an abundance of sources, there is no other historical period in antiquity for which we have so much 
um, a source material. We have literary texts, we have scientific treatises, for instance, the works of medical doctors, technicians, we have inscriptions, we have papyri, and with the help of all this material, we are in a position to study uh, phenomena connected with the night. And this um, source material offers us the possibility, first of all, to make comparisons within the Greek world, and second, to study developments, to see changes, let's say, from the 4th century BC to the 4th century AD in a vast uh, geographical uh, area. And this invites us to reevaluate the importance of various factors in the experience and the development of the night. A history of Greek nights has not been written, and in this talk, unless I will continue talking until the night, I cannot present a short history of the night in the Greek world, eine kleine Nachtgeschichte, as it were, but I will attempt to historize the Greek nights roughly from the time of Alexander the Great to the establishment of Christianity. The title of my talk has promised you night stories, and I will not disappoint you, let me give you a night story, a typical night story, which will also allow me to explain why the night is socially significant. This story is the narrative given by a certain Euphiletos, an Athenian man, who explains in a court in Athens in the early 4th century BC why he killed someone. He killed him because he found him in his wife's bed. Doing so, he describes nighttime activities in a non-elite Athenian household in the early 4th century. So I will read the text uh, which you have uh, here. Uh, and it is a very interesting source because it gives all sorts of information about everyday life in Athens in the early 4th century BC. So this uh, man says, I have a modest two-story house which was equal space for the women's and men's quarters on the upper and lower floors. Usually the women in ancient Greece sleep uh, upstairs, the men sleep downstairs. When our child was born, its mother nursed it and saw that she would not risk a fall on her way downstairs whenever the baby needed bathing, I took to living on the upper level while the women lived downstairs. A fatal mistake, as you will see. From that time then, it became such a regular arrangement that my wife would often go downstairs to sleep with a child to nurse it and to stop it crying. This is again an experience that many of you have had. This was the way we lived for quite a while and I never had any cause for concern but carried on in the fullest belief that my wife was the most proper woman in the city. Time passed, gentlemen, and I came home unexpectedly from the farm. After dinner, one night activity, the child started to cry and become restless. It was being deliberately provoked by our slave girl into behaving like this, probably uh, making the girl to cry so that it will become intolerable, because that individual, that is the woman's lover, was in the house. I found out all about this later. So I told my wife to go down and nurse the child to stop it crying. To begin with, she did not want to go, claiming that she was glad to see me home after so long. When I got annoyed and then ordered her to leave, she said, yes, so you can have a go at the young slave here. You made a grab at her before when you were drunk. All these reminders of Donald Trump, of course. I laughed and she got up, closed the door as she left, pretending it was a joke and drew the bolt across. Thinking there was nothing serious in this and not suspecting a thing, I happily settled down to sleep as I had come back from my farm work. This is again important information. The farmer experiences the night in a different way because he comes home from the fields tired and what he wants is to have dinner, perhaps sex, and then sleep. About dawn, my wife returned and opened the door. When I asked her, why the door had made a noise in the night, she claimed that the lamp near the baby had gone out and so she had gone to get a light from the neighbors. So you can move out of your house during the night, knock at your neighbor's door and get some light. I said nothing as I believed this was the truth. I noticed though that her face was made up, although her brother had died not 30 days earlier. Still I said nothing at all about it and I left without a word. 
Now I skip a passage in which the man is informed by another slave that his wife has a lover. So he decides to uh, find out about all that. And this is how the story goes on. Stro Sostratos is my friend and is well disposed towards me. I met him at sunset, again night, as he was coming home from his farm. You see again the daytime activities of a typical Athenian who owns land. He goes out to the fields. Sometimes this is a walk of two or three hours to go out to the fields and return home tired in the night. Realizing that none of his family would be at home at that time to welcome him on his return, I invited him to have dinner with me. We came to my house, went upstairs and had dinner. After he had had a good meal, he left and I went to bed. Eratosthenes, this is the lover, came in, gentlemen, and the girl woke me immediately and informed me that he was inside. I told her to mind the door and went downstairs, living without making a sound. I went around to different neighbors and found that some were not at home in the night, others were out of town. Gathering the largest group I could find of those who were at home, I made my way back to the house. We took torches from the nearest inn and entered. The door was open because the girl had seen to it. We pushed open the door of the bedroom, and those of us who were the first to enter saw him still lying next to my wife. The ones coming in later saw him standing naked on the bed. I struck him and knocked him down. Then I twisted him round and tied his hands behind his back. I asked him why he was disgracing my house by entering it. He confessed that he was in the wrong, and he begged and entreated me not to kill him, but to agree to a financial settlement. I said to him, Your executioner is not I, but the law of the city, whose violation you thought less important than your pleasures. And then he killed him. So I... <laughs> have to return to my text. I have prepared a text because if I don't keep to my text, I may be tempted to talk for hours and I'm sure that this is not in anybody's interest. So, this passage addresses various aspects of Athenian nights and some of these aspects are more familiar than others. Dining, yes, of course. Getting drunk, why not? Having sex, if you can. Inviting a friend, spending time in an inn, and having segmented sleep. You notice the segmented sleep, continually interrupted by some kind of activity. Uh, then going to the neighbors to get light, feeding a child, or opening the door to receive a lover, going to the neighbors to seek help, going to an inn to get torches, arresting and killing the adulterer. This passage also clearly indicates the historical dimensions of the night. We observe that the night is experienced in a different manner by the infant and the grown-ups, by the man and the woman, the master and the slave, the farmer who returns from the fields exhausted and those who still have the energy to go to an inn, the inhabitant of an urban center and the population of the countryside. Finally, this passage alludes to the treatment of the night by legislation, by law. Euphiletos was allowed to kill his wife's lover because according to Athenian law, if a crime is committed during the night in the house of someone, that is if somebody intrudes a house in order to steal or commit another crime, the punishment is death. And it can be imposed, implemented immediately. That is, the owner of the house has the right to kill whoever enters his house inappropriately. I know that this is music to the ears of the American Rifle Association, National Rifle Association, uh, but this is bad music. <laughs> and uh, we know that reason uh, teaches us uh, otherwise. Differences and changes in the reality of the night are sometimes concealed by the fact that the perception of the night and darkness has been persistent for millennia. You will Tell me, well, what is new about all that and why should we study the history of the night? All this sounds familiar. I will get to that. From primeval times when artificial light was provided by fire burning in a cave or a shelter, giving warmth and protecting from wild animals, to modern societies, 
humans engaged and engaged in a certain repertoire of nocturnal activities, which I have summarized on this slide. The night provides time for recreation, for sex and sleep, for the joint consumption of food, for storytelling, singing and dancing, today replaced by TV, YouTube, and so on. Perennially, the night provides the setting for conviviality in small groups, the family, the members of exclusive associations or conspirators, and only on special occasions it gathers masses of the like-minded in all-night celebrations and vigils. The night invites us to watch the stars and observe the faces of the moon. This has become a little bit difficult in mega cities when the artificial light does not allow you to observe anything on the skies. Uh, although people still believe uh, that the phases of the moon influence their fortune and behavior. Furthermore, the night offers the opportunity for dreaming and experiencing supernatural phenomena. Also, for whatever reason, uh, aliens only visit the Earth during the night. I don't know why <laughs> no alien sighting <laughs> ever takes place uh, at daytime. Um, People continue dreaming of dead relatives. Actually, one of the reasons that we believe in the existence of afterlife is precisely because we dream of people and communicate with people uh, who are dead. Uh, although dreaming of the gods somehow uh, has come out of fashion. Finally, the night is connected with dangers and the um, increased need for security and policing. Although life in many historical periods has reached extremely high levels of sophistication, technological advancement, and urbanization, also social complexity, the principal activities, experiences, and perceptions of the night have demonstrated surprising persistence. Almost nothing has changed in respect to this list that I have provided here. For this reason, the night has been enduringly associated with a certain set of perceptions. It plays a great part in the creation of a sense of togetherness. It is not a coincidence, for instance, that initiation rites in secret societies or modern American fraternities usually take place in the night. It is intimately linked with fear and anxiety, but also with erotic desire, and um, as the night commonly occasions sleep and dreaming, it is associated with death and is regarded as the most effectual time for the communication between the mortals and supernatural powers, the mortals and the gods, or the living and the dead. For the longest period of human history, the night has been a period in which human activities were impeded by darkness and the inadequacies of artificial light. This has shaped a polarity between night and day. For this reason, the night has become what the linguist would call a termed time period or a termed word, that is a word that carries special significance. Let me give you an example of what I mean, uh, quoting my favorite, one of my favorite songs called Porter's Night and Day, not as sung by Frank Sinatra, but as performed by Ella Fitzgerald. Night and day, you are the one, only you beneath the moon and under the sun, whether near to me or far, it's no matter, darling, where you are, I think of you night and day. Because of this polarity, night is a marked word, a term that carries special social and cultural connotations. It gives emphasis to a statement. And in these cases, it enhances emotional display. In Porter's song, the intensity of desire can be really expressed only when the partition of day and night is lifted and day and night become a continuum. In other words, to say, I love you, is a clear statement. To say, I love you by day, will probably not generate a lot of enthusiasm. But to say, I love you day and night, this is an unambiguous statement. It doesn't leave any doubt about one's feelings. 
And this usage has not changed in millennia. Misfortune by day, misery by night is an ancient Egyptian curse. And in a letter written in Egypt about 1900 years ago, a man implores his wife, who has abandoned him, I want you to know that ever since you left me, I have been in mourning, weeping at night and lamenting during the day. The polarity of night and day often leads to a shift or even a reversal of meaning, perception, and evaluation of ordinary daytime activities. Let us take the example of writing on the walls. Writing on the walls is um, a modern habit, uh, which is not what I am discussing here, not graffiti. Writing on the walls in ancient times is something that is sanctioned by authority. You write wall, uh, laws, you write official text on the walls. It is something that imposes norms. It regulates life. It is something that is normative. What about writing on the walls during the night? Those of you who have seen uh, Monty Python's The Life of Brian, remember the famous sin of uh, the Jew writing Romani ite domum, Romans go home, <laughs> during the night. Writing on the walls during the night is exactly the opposite. It sub, um, versus um, uh, authority, it is against authority, it is something that is connected with secrecy, it is something that is connected with opposition, it is divisive, it is not something that unites and regulates norms, it's something that actually is against norms. And I could go on explaining how exactly the same activity, when it's conducted during the day and during the night, can have an entirely different meaning from simple things such as uh, writing a poem during the day or writing a poem or a letter during the night. Sometimes you even mention the fact that I am writing this email message during the night. Why? It is a useless information, but you mention it in order to show how dedicated you are to uh, whomever you uh, want to uh, communicate with. But it is also clear in other more complex activities, such as hunting during the day and hunting during the night, or uh, sacrificing during the day, praying during the day and praying during the night. For instance, prayers during the day in ancient Greece are addressed to the gods uh, high above, and they usually ask, uh, seek for protection. Praying during the night is entirely different. It's black magic. If you pray during the night to the gods of the underworld in order to damage someone. Uh, but I don't have the time to uh, explain all this. Just to give you another example, debating. Debating by day. It happens in the popular assembly, in the courts, in the gymnasia, in the marketplace. It is open. It is accessible to all. Debating in the night is entirely different. It is a matter of the small, closed society, of the small group that sometimes may be against and not in favor of democracy. So one uh, form of debate is democratic, the other is undemocratic, potentially subversive. For all these reasons, when the authors of ancient texts, and now I explain why I'm telling you all that, I'm telling you all that because these perceptions and this polarity has shaped the material that I study. In order to understand the text that I study properly, I have to take into consideration this, because the texts that I study are full of stereotypes that are connected with these perceptions. That is, when I study ancient texts, it is more likely that certain subjects, such as sex and violence, will be overrepresented than other subjects. It is more likely that an ancient source would mention that somebody was killed during the night, such as, for instance, in this text from Olbia, in the north shore of the Black Sea, where the only information we get is that the enemies, we don't know who they are, we don't know how many they were, we do not know if they were arrested, but what is certainly mentioned is the fact that they killed someone during the night in order to uh, um, highlight the cowardice uh, of the murderers. So it is more likely that we'll find such information that we'll find information about things that did happen but are not mentioned, such as, for instance, a fisherman spreading his nets in the sea under the moon. You won't find, a, find any such information, so if you just concentrate on the ancient text, it is most likely that you will get a lot of stereotypes and that you will not get uh, information about the complete, the full picture of reality. Another example. Some uh, people were killed during an earthquake in the island of Imbros. 
uh, the grave inscription states, in the dark night, the roof of the house buried the three dead. We slept a bitter night after dinner, and now we inhabit the dark palace of Persephone. Here, the fact that the earthquake took place, again, earthquakes have the bad habit of happening during the night, I don't know why, uh, except for Japan, uh, for whatever reason. Uh, the fact that the earthquake happened during the night is unnecessary uh, as an information. It is bad enough that the three people were killed. But to mention that the earthquake happened during the night adds to the fear and the empathy that this um, uh, passage uh, creates. Or sometimes it shows the engagement of someone. For instance, in an inscription from Olympia, a pancratias, this is the equivalent of modern kickboxers, is praised because he endured to continue the fight until the night, until they saw the stars. So here the night is again mentioned because it shows the extraordinary achievement of an athlete. For this reason, in narratives, in my ancient sources, the night is an enhancer of emotional arousal. The night as a word functions as an acoustic signal. You hear the word night and immediately you feel certain things. It creates a dramatic setting for events and for this reason it creates stereotypes so what we will find is information about the destruction of a city. Uh, for instance, these are images of the sack of Troy, which of course takes place during the night, with the uh, uh, Trojan horse being brought into the city, the Achaeans descending from the horse and doing all these things that you he see here, killing. Or this is the other kind of information that you're going to find, information about erotic desire, sex, and so on. But reality is more complicated than that, and this brings me to uh, the last part of my talk, that is, what really changes? My method is very simple. My method is not to look for references to the night in the ancient sources, because I'm going to find the usual suspects. My method is to uh, proceed in an entirely different way, that is, to ask the question, what factors determine changes in general in the historical period that I study? And I have summarized these factors here. And my question is not, what do the ancient sources tell us about the night? My question is, how all these factors that are important from the 4th century BC onwards have an impact on the night? And such factors are the existence of monarchy, the existence of big courts, first of Hellenistic kings, then of the Roman emperor. The second important factor is the rule of the elite, this is a general trend in this historical period that small groups of uh, people uh, who are usually uh, benefactors monopolize uh, social uh, life uh, by offering benefactions to the cities and expecting in uh, a reciprocity uh, that uh, uh, their rule is uh, accepted. There is a simple, there are complicated definitions of reciprocity. Ask any sociologist about them. There is a simple definition which you'll find in the musical Chicago, in the song of Mama. I have a little motto, always gets me through. If you're good to Mama, Mama is good to you. So this is the definition of reciprocity. So the benefactors give money and the cities accept the rule. We'll see how this affects the night. Mobility. The fact that in this historical period there is a larger movement of populations than ever before or ever later in antiquity. Urbanization, the spread of um, uh, urban centers, cities. The greater visibility of women. Women are in a position to administer their own property. They are visible in the public sphere. They occupy offices. They are uh, allowed to uh, walk in the streets and so on. The existence of private associations private clubs, we would say today, the diffusion of mystery cults, and uh, the existence of science and technical literature, and finally, violence. And violence is a good place to start because there is no other period in Greek history that has so many wars continually and so much violence as the period between Alexander the Great and Cleopatra, between 330 and 30 BC. In these 300 years, there is non-stop, there are non-stop wars. How does this change the night? 
This increases also civil wars. This is, increases the awareness of safety issues. This creates a new type of technical literature, which is how to defend a city during a siege. This creates handbooks about siege techniques and so on. And this creates, and this is the important factor for the night, the awareness that the night is far more dangerous than the day and measures need to be taken. Of course, any military commander has someone to guard the camp during the night. Yes, this existed from the beginning of time, but it is only from the Hellenistic period on, that is after Alexander the Great, that we find detailed information about the establishment of night guards in cities. Uh, 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 and this is a, a process that I would call Entnachtung, that is making the night in German, the night less nocturnal, or you can call it the taming of the Nix, the taming of the night, or how the night was won. This is a process that um, uh, makes uh, daytime activities extended during the night, increases safety awareness, and makes the night more effective. As I said, making the night safer is a process that starts in the 4th century BC with military handbooks, with the introduction introduction of offices that did not exist before. For instance, the general of the night, who is an official who is explicitly responsible for taking care of safety during the night and with the existence of night guards. I'm going to very briefly mention uh, these factors. Another important factor that nobody would thought of is the existence of private clubs. Why do private clubs exist? Private clubs exist because of another fact that I mentioned before, that is because of mobility. People move, they come to new cities, they are foreigners, they seek a new identity, they seek some form of solidarity, conviviality, contact with other persons. Since they are not citizens, they are excluded from certain city, civic institutions, and what they do is they organize themselves in private clubs. Private clubs existed also earlier, but they were an isolated phenomenon. From the 4th century BC onwards, they spread throughout the Greek world in large numbers. What is their impact on the night? Well, their impact on the night is that the only activity of these private clubs is to organize drinking parties. So a phenomenon that was connected with aristocratic society in the 6th century, in the 5th century, in the 4th century, uh, this is the aristocratic, the old traditional symposium, is a symposium in which only noblemen and only men are allowed to participate, no foreigners, no slaves, no women. All this changes because of the existence of uh, private clubs, because in private clubs, women are occasionally admitted, slaves are occasionally admitted, and foreigners are actually the main component of such private clubs. This means that an activity that is exclusive privilege of aristocracy becomes spread, and this activity is nighttime drinking party. In some cases, the nighttime uh, drinking party takes place only one day in the month. For instance, Deca, 10, Decatistai are the 10th day drinkers, that is, people who drink on the 10th day of the month. The Numenia Stai, Numenia means the new moon, that is the first day of the month. The Numenia Stai are those who gather on the first day of uh, every month, Stamtis, we would call it in German, and drink together. But there are of course, you can belong to more than one club, so you can drink on the first day <laughs> of the month and on the tenth day, and so on and so forth. And there are also uh, clubs that organize drinking parties far more often. Of course, these drinking parties are associated with other kind of security issues. That is, when people drink and get drunk, what happens is that they violate rules. So we have a lot of information about safety uh, issues during such drinking parties. Nighttime activities existed also in connection with religion from the beginning of time. Weddings, for instance, take place during the night. Nocturnal celebrations take place once a month during the night. There are divinities that we, and we can recognize that such activities take place during the night because of the existence of torches. Uh, I will return to this in a moment, but an ancient artist does not have the possibilities of a modern artist to show the red light of dusk, for instance. So how can you, as an ancient artist, paint like this, 
so that the scene takes place during the night. You do this with devices such as the representation, for instance, of uh, torches. So although uh, there are uh, divinities that are only worshipped, uh, primarily worshipped during the night, such as Hecate or Artemis. But what happens in the Hellenistic period, and it is again connected with the existence of private clubs, and also connected with the existence of a new type of religiosity, what we would call today new religions, religions that promise safety during this life and a better afterlife after death. In order to achieve all this, you have to be initiated in a so-called mystery cult, in a sect. And again, this spreads uh, throughout the Greek world. And again, these clubs of the private uh, initiates organize nocturnal ceremonies. I give you here just one example out of many. This is an endowment in an inscription mentioned in an inscription from Salonica in the first century CE. And uh, the person who gave the endowment uh, made the present and future initiates, the mist, promise under oath that they will preserve the worship of the god, the orgiastic rites, and the rite of the bread that takes place at midnight. This is a ritual of bread distribution that takes place during midnight. And this is what is new. I want to make clear one thing before I approach to the end of my talk. The one thing is that none of the phenomena that I'm describing appears for the first time in the Hellenistic period. Uh, but all these phenomena become far more common in the Hellenistic period. As ancient historians, we have difficulties in doing quantitative studies. We do not have the possibility to present statistics. I cannot tell you that in the 6th century only 1% of the citizens participated in a private club and in the 3rd century it was 80%. I cannot do that. But what I can certainly recognize in the source material are trends and quantitative changes even if I cannot measure them. So what is very is attested in earlier periods, but isolated, becomes very common, becomes the reality of the night in ancient cities. Because there are not just one club, there are many clubs, and then you have also the Christians, and you have the Jews. And because of this general trend, they implement exactly the same rituals in their own religions. This is one of the earliest references that we have to Christianity. It is a letter written by Pliny, the governor of Bithynia, in the early 2nd century AD, who wanted to know what on earth these Christians are. So what do you do as a conscientious governor in Bithynia? You grab a couple of slaves, you torture them, because this is the only way you can tell, uh, they can tell you the truth, and after you have tortured them, you write to the emperor what you have learned. So what he learned is that the sum and substance of their fault or error has been that they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn. Sometimes we tend to interpret this as um, the Christians hiding. This is why they meet during the night. I'm not so sure. My impression is that the Christians meet during the night for the celebration because everybody else meets during the night for their religious celebrations. The Dionysiac myths, the Egyptian mystery uh, worshippers, the Mithras uh, worshippers, and the Jews, and so on. So everybody does uh, this. What is also important in this period, and this is another form of religious behavior that is very isolated in earlier periods and become extremely common in the Hellenistic period and the imperial period, is what we call incubation. It has nothing to do with incubation in modern natural life sciences. Incubation means just to spend a night in a sanctuary. To spend a night in the sanctuary expecting to be visited by the god and be cured. We have here a representation uh, from uh, Pyreus of such a scene. Here you see the god Asclepius and his daughter Hygieia, the representation of health. And here you see a sick woman. The god approaches her, does something, and she is cured. We have hundreds of texts that refer to this. Before the 5th century, it happens in two places, in the Asclepiaeon of Epidaurus and in Athens, after the 4th century, there is hardly any important, significant city that doesn't have a place where you go in order to spend the night and dream of the god. Did people start dreaming in this period? Of course not. People dreamt from the beginning of time. But to go to a place in order to dream, yes, this is new. Did people dream? Yes, they dreamt. But did they write about their dreams? No. This is also something new. 
and people start from the third century BC onwards writing about their dream experience, setting up altars and dedication, explaining, I have done this because the God told me to do so in a dream. And these are the quantitative changes that I am referring to and change uh, the reality of the night. I show you here a reconstruction of the sanctuary of Epidaurus. There is a big room here, actually the, one of the biggest rooms in the sanctuary, which is the so-called Abaton. This is the incubation hall where the patients went. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to give you some examples of what exactly happened, but we have these narratives. I was bold, and the god came, and he put an ointment on my head, and the uh, hair started growing. Unfortunately, the uh, <laughs> recipe is not given, uh, and so on. Or uh, the woman saw so was five years pregnant, and she gave uh, birth to a child that started walking, of course, after five years uh, of pregnancy, immediately uh, after she was visited by the god. So this is new. And this changes again the reality of the night. All these are small pieces in a big puzzle. If you just take them individually, they are just one single phenomenon. But if you take them all together, they create the new reality of the night. Another new reality is the importance of dreams as a science. Already Aristotle had written a book in the late 4th century about the dreams. But from the Hellenistic period onwards, you have handbooks explaining the significance of dreams, and you have professional specialists. You see here uh, an advertisement uh, signed by a dream interpreted in Hellenistic Egypt, who says, I interpret dreams upon divine command. The interpreter is Cretan. That is, I'm, uh, you get the good uh, dream interpretations uh, in, my, uh, in my shop. And you have these professional dream interpreters uh, becoming uh, very common. Another uh, important development because of the existence of nightlife is the necessity to measure time. It is in the 3rd century BC that a new accurate water clock is invented by Ctesibios. You had sundials before but unfortunately sundials work only uh, when the sun shines. They don't work during the night. So why do you measure the time during the night? There are possibilities with primitive, uh, with sand uh, clocks and water clocks and so on, but the new water clock invented by Ctesibius was extremely accurate. Another technological development, precisely in order to fill the night life also with light, is the development of new forms of illumination, new elaborate lamps with more than one opening, for instance, with precious materials, uh, and also the development of artificial lighting in the streets of major centers. Uh, an important uh, form of architecture that we find from the approximately the 4th century BC are big so-called colonnaded streets, and these colonnaded streets, we know this from sources in late antiquity, were illuminated with torches. Also, we have information uh, from ancient sources that the authorities wanted that the owners of shops, the owners of baths, and so on, put torches and light uh, in order to illuminate them. Another important activity that is connected with benefactors, I return to the subject of the benefactors, why, what do they spend the money for? Some of them spend their money so that the baths and the gymnasia, the fitness clubs, we would say uh, today, were open also during the night, and not only open during the night for men, but open during the night also for women. When one benefactor does this, this is exceptional, and it is mentioned in inscription. But other benefactors repeat his example, this becomes a trendsetter, and if you are a benefactor and don't spend money for opening the bands during the night, then you are a bad benefactor. So this is how trends are created, and again, how the night is filled with life. And I think that it is not a coincidence that the only two ancient wonders of the world that are associated with the historical period are both of them associated with light. It is the lighthouse of Alexandria, here a reconstruction, and the Colossus of Rhodes, which was holding a torch and was again related with the night. Since the night is the time when you dream, you want uh, and you... As, uh, can establish a connection with the dead and with supernatural powers, you want to make this connection efficient. 
And then we have another form of handbooks that did not exist before. These are the magical handbooks. I saw you here an example with recipes of how you can make a woman come to you whether she likes it or not, how you can uh, uh, defeat your opponent in uh, athletic games. Uh, and these are, you have uh, explanations and then you have magical terms and magical images. You create uh, wax uh, dolls and uh, so on. To finish this talk. The Greeks were fascinated with the night. They didn't have the possibility to represent the night the way a painter would do in the 19th century. But they tr tried to do this with other tricks, for instance, as I explained before, by representing figures holding torches, or just the subject of a representation uh, was directly connected uh, with the night. For instance, whoever saw the Trojan horse knew this scene's take place during the night. When you see a sleeping satyr, who is probably dreaming, as one can may recognize in uh, the rendering of the eyebrows and the mouth and so on, as an ancient spectator, you immediately know this scene takes place during the night. When you see the old drunk lady, now in the museum in the Glyptothek in Munich, you know that this is a nocturnal scene. Modern audiences that see these works of art in modern museums do not associate them with night and darkness the way an ancient viewer is accustomed to do so. This is why, again, we need to bring to mind the importance of the night in order also to be able to reinterpret uh, these uh, images. Or in a tragedy. Tragedies were only performed during daytime. How do you show that something takes place during the night? For instance, the killing of Ressus in a tragedy attributed to Euripides. The whole tragedy takes place during the night, but it is performed uh, daytime uh, in open air. The 21st lines of this tragedy are full of words that are etymologically related with the night. What happens during the night? Where is the night watch? And so on. So that by listening to the word night, 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 in the first 20 lines, even if you're an idiot, you know that this is a scene that takes place uh, during the night. Uh, we also have uh, a kind of discourse that is um, uh, uh, discussions about the night. I don't have the time to... Uh, I'll just mention one uh, story to, that shows how aware the Greeks are of the importance of the night. There is a wonderful author of the second century AD, Lucian, very funny author. I recommend to read translations of his works. One of his works is called The True Story, Alephes Historia. What is a true story is a trip to the moon. It is the earliest, uh, it's not Gilles Verne who invented the genre, already Lucian has written a journey to the moon. And one of the places that this traveler visits on his way to the moon, or back, I don't remember exactly, is the Lichnopolis, which is a city which is inhabited by lamps, that is the creator of light. And this could have not been written by somebody who lived in a different historical period than in a period in which lamps are so important as artificial illumination. Uh, the modern equivalent would be an author writing about a city uh, whose inhabitants are smartphones. So this shows the importance of night uh, as it is understood by contemporary populations. So in the late 4th century uh, AD, an, a historian could write that Antioch is a city where the brightness of the lights at night commonly equals the brightness of day. And an orator, Libanius, writes, the torch of the sun is followed by other lamps, surpassing in brightness the lamp festival of the Egyptians. In our city, night and day differ only in the form of the light. As regards the various crafts, night and day do not differ. Some conduct skillful work with their hands, others laugh gently and turn to song. So what the authors, both authors living on more or less the same time in the late 4th century declare is the victory of the day over the night. Now, this victory did not last for long. Not much longer than a century later, the night had reconquered its territory. Why? Not because of the lack of technology. The technology existed. But because of changing social, cultural, and religious uh, contexts. And this is the sum, actually, of my talk, that in our overconfident society where we regard technology as our greatest achievement, and it may be, we do not think how fragile sometimes technological achievements and process, uh, progress may be 
when other factors, I just mentioned Islamic fundamentalism, for instance, as an example, may undermine things that have been achieved by technology, society, and culture. The ancient Greeks made this experience for the first time from the rise of a night culture in the 4th century to the defeat of the night in the late 4th century AD in order to see that this victory disappeared because, as I said, of other uh, political, cultural, and social factors that would be the subject of another lecture. And I thank you very much for your attention. Perfect timing as well. Thank you so much. If one dreams of a cross-disciplinary academic training at CERN, this is it. <laughs> and uh, the next uh, talk about after the fourth century, I can't wait. <laughs> <But> <laughs> so please, if you have questions for Professor Hanyotis, press the button and don't hesitate. Very clear. Okay, I had one. Yeah. Who is this? Where are you? Over here. Um, yes. So I was uh, I was interested by the over here, interested by the the uh, account of the murder, and at the end of that, you mentioned something that alluded to the fact that ultimately that was decided uh, in the murderer's favor, because it occurred at night. So does that suggest that if the same thing happened, uh, this guy, however, was coming back early from the fields and uh, caught someone in bed with his wife during the day, and he murdered? Uh, the adulterer, this would not have been justified? Yeah. Uh, no, the, the killing of an adulterer is justified, the killing of the man, not of the woman. And this is connected with ancient perception that the woman uh, is always the victim of seduction and so on. She doesn't have her own will, so the man is the one who is uh, responsible. Think about that whatever you will. Adultery is punished by death, but here, the night is also mentioned in this very long narrative because what you uh, have to take into consideration is that the defendant in the trial only has a limited amount of time. And he takes this time, instead of explaining other things, to describe in all this detail the fact that this is a nocturnal setting. And I think that this is done precisely in order to influence the jurors that even they had some um, inclination to consider this as a murder precisely, not only because it is uh, the murder of an adulterer, but, but because in addition to this, it is something that violates the sanctity, so to say, of the house during the night, this murder is even more justified. I, there are other uh, examples that... Um, oops, uh, I think that I did something. Oops. There are uh, other uh, examples that uh, show this. For instance, um, Augustus, the emperor, um, had to deal with a strange case in uh, a small uh, town. Uh, the case is uh, as follows, and we have the letter of Augustus uh, describing the situation. During the night, the house of someone was besieged by some of his opponents day after day after day, and night after night after night. And then one night, uh, the owner of the house ordered the slave to empty a night pot on the head of those who were besieging the house. Unfortunately, the pot fell off the hands of the slave and killed one of them. So the question is, who is responsible for that, the slave, the pot, or the master who gave the order? And Augustus decides that actually the killing was justified, and he adds, because... Where are we going to end if people attack the other, other people's houses during the night? So the emphasis is always given during the night. We have a large number of papyri in Egypt that describes robberies in houses. We know when something took place during the night because it was always stated, because it arouses the sentiment of anger in the jurors, in the judge, in the uh, provincial governor, the emperor who is going to judge the case. So in all these cases, the defendant or the person who wants to persuade a judge creates this atmosphere of darkness, danger, threat, 
in order to achieve the proper uh, response. So the short answer is adultery is punishable by death, but in case the jurors had some doubts, then you have the additional element of uh, the crime taking place during the night. And we have a lot of ancient laws, both in Rome, in Alexandria, and in Greek cities, that say exactly this, that if a crime takes place during the night, even if it is a theft, if you steal something during the day, you just pay its value uh, double its value. If you steal exactly the same thing during the night, you are going to be killed. <laughs> it didn't abolish crime, I'm telling you that. <laughs> or adultery for that matter. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a question. It says there, the torch of the sun is followed by the other lamp, surpassing in brightness the lamp festival of the Egyptians. In our city, night and day differ only by the form of the light. I would say, for me, a what that brings up is a question of where did they get all the energy? Because that's our same problem now with, yes. with the amount of energy that we use yeah. to, to light the night or light all of our activities. That must have been very important to, to them yes. for it's one thing, but where did they get all that energy? Yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, basically, illumination during the night is uh, done uh, in the Greek world with olive oil. So these are oil lamps. Uh, and uh, we also know that one of the major expenses of ancient benefactors is to supply olive oil uh, either to the cities or the baths or the gymnasia because olive oil um, makes food more uh, tasty today. But in ancient times, it had other uses as well. For instance, athletes covered the body with olive oil, for instance, wrestlers. But it is also the major source of energy for uh, artificial illumination. There are also some exceptional cases. For instance, other materials could also be used. Nafta, for instance, that we know that the Egyptians um, uh, used. Uh, there are uh, other materials that cover the torches so that the torch can uh, burn for a longer period of time. Uh, but uh, all uh, the major um, uh, source of energy is olive oil. Uh, can I, uh, th uh, thank you very much for an interesting uh, lecture. And I want... I was thinking, you know, to, uh, mm, to connect uh, the scientific work which was done in the ancient time with what you are saying today. So, I mean, the night come in the winter, let's say, at 6 to 12. So, it's not the night where you sleep, but you can uh, actually work, right? So, my interpretation when I was... A, visiting museums and see these lamps which works with oil you just mentioned. So these oil lamps allow to light many hours and that's critical because then you can sit and work and write the text, scientific text, let's say in mathematics, physics, geometry. Yep. So it seems to me that the, what, what you last time mentioned these lamps, oil lamps, is extremely important invention which actually generate uh, scientific work during these uh, evenings, not nights, but I will say evenings, when it is dark, but still yep. artificial light helps to work. And yep. I think that this is a, there's many reasons why in a, at the time you mentioned there was so much achievement in science. and. Mm. I was thinking that, I never read about that, but I was thinking maybe you will talk about a lot. And yeah. I was thinking that the, the, the reason that there was a light was one of, one of the another reasons which was. Yeah. Uh, you are right that you have also raised um, uh, another important uh, thing, which is writing during the night and creating during the night. Uh, let me start with a second, uh, because it gives me the opportunity to make the remark again that the life of the night is again a social uh, factor. For instance, the one who creates uh, work, uh, the scientist and so on, this is an intellectual elite in Greek cities. It is not everyone. There are other people who write during the night, but they may write just an erotic poem. And actually this is a topos that uh, poetry smells of olive oil because it is written during uh, the night under the light of the olive lamps. Uh, what I uh, would like to uh, clarify is that olive uh, oil lamps 
exist already from the Bronze Age. This is not a new development. For instance, we know them from Ainoan palaces, uh, huge stone lamps that, uh, with cavities where uh, the olive oil uh, was put. So this is not the... Uh, there is an advancement also in the manufacture of lamps, and the whole uh, modern discipline just studies lamps, which is an extremely important subject, as you uh, mentioned. And um, actually, what you say is what I said at the beginning, that there is an interplay between the need and the existence of what accommodates that need. But uh, I think that we should not underestimate the importance of the need, that is, the existence, the production of scientific literature during the night presupposes other factors such as the scientific curiosity, the development uh, of philosophical schools, the possibilities for education, the possibilities or not possibilities to conduct experiments. Let's think, for instance, about medicine and uh, how medicine could not advance in the medieval ages because anatomy was not uh, allowed to be practiced and how it uh, advanced under very uh, cruel and uh, and human conditions in uh, Ptolemaic Alexandria when some doctors were allowed to cut people who were already alive and see how their uh, heart um, uh, works. Again, <laughs> this is, I think, a good case in which you see the interplay between the political conditions that allow something and the advance of science and technology, and things are not different. Also, as uh, regards, for instance, find uh, funding for science and research uh, in uh, our contemporary world. Um, in this passage right here, I, I kind of read like a there's this kind of a sense of pride, um, like, oh, our, you know, you, um, is it possible maybe uh, that they wanted to conquer the night just out of a sense of um, kind of like exploration or mm -hmm. conquer it just because they could as opposed yeah. to just out of convenience or anything yeah. like that? Uh, this is a very good uh, question. And uh, again, uh, I only had an hour at the most at my disposal. So some things I just left unmentioned, but I'm glad that you asked the question. There is a sense of pride, yes, because both passages, both Amianus Marcellinus and Libanius, refer to the same city, Antioch. And they claim, actually, that Antioch is, but they claim this wrongly, that it is the only city that has artificial lighting and the only city in which the, light, uh, the, day, um, uh, the night has become day. But these are cliches, are exactly as the same uh, cliché of uh, New York as the, uh, the city that never sleeps, or Paris, the uh, La Cité des Lumières. Is it the only city of the lights and the only city that doesn't sleep? Of course not. So again, such texts need to be contextualized and seen in their respective context. And in both cases, it is the fact that two authors want to underline the importance of their urban center as compared to other urban uh, centers. But because they do so, they also exaggerate. And this is why it is important in our research not just to uh, limit ourselves to one or two sources, but try to look through the entire spectrum of source material in order to be able to place them into context. For instance, as I said, if you read uh, these two authors, you will have to say Antioch is the only city that has lights. Well, this is not true, because at the same time, Ephesus, we know it through an inscription, has torches uh, on their uh, main streets. And through archaeological evidence, we know that this must have taken place in other cities as well. So again, this is something that made a statement uh, relative, and this is precisely what we as historians need to do. Uh, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You put pieces together. The only problem is that you do not know the picture that you are constructing. I'm a fanatic jigsaw puzzle uh, solver, but uh, when I do that, unless I do a only blue, uh, this is what I currently do, le bleu uh, of Miro, <laughs> uh, you know what you are trying to reconstruct. And the other problem with our jigsaw puzzles and ancient historians is that 90% of the pieces are missing. <laughs> 